welcome those of us in person, those of us who are tuned in remotely. Uh, I'm TK Daniel, uh, chair of the Emeritus Academy for this year. Um, and I'd like to welcome you all. Um, this is our last lecture of, of the season. And the last lecture also does two things. One, of course, is the very important lecture. And the other is the introduce, introduction of new members of the Emeritus Academy. And I'd like uh, um, Associate Provost Helen Malone to come to the front with me. As well as Jackie it to come to the front. And what we want to do is to introduce uh, the new members and hand out certificates in the process. So as I call your name, would you mind coming up? Mary Jo Bowl. Mary Jo Bowl, is she here? Uh, Jane Hathaway, I know I said it. Oh, Rick Hines. Robert Horton. Ken Lee, Susan Van Pelt Peacher, Ken Ronaldo, Brad Bergerford, uh, let's see. Shelly Quinn should be also up there, right? Yeah. And Amy Schumer. Round of applause for thank you so much. I thank you very much. I want to also mention the names of uh, persons who have entered the academy who uh, could not be here today. Uh, Alicia, Ber Alicia Bertone, uh, Stavos um, Constantino, Jennifer Crocker, uh, let's see, Michelle Herman, Janice Keycolt Glazer, David Terman. Rich Graff, Randolph Moses, and Fabian Tan. Can we give them a round of applause as well? Now, moving on to the sexy part of today's uh, outing. Um, I'd like to introduce to us uh, Thomas Rickeyser. And Dr. Rickeyser joined the faculty at the Ohio State University College of Public Health in 2009 as the first Stephen F. Loeb's Distinguished Professor of Health Services Management and Policy. He served as chair of the Division of Health Services Management and Policy in the College of Public Health from 2012 until his retirement in 2020. 
Prior to joining the faculty at OSU, Dr. Rick Kaiser served for 20 years on the faculty uh, of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, at uh, the University of Washington School of Public, Public Health. There and at OSU, he taught courses in health services organization, health economics, health policy, and health uh, services research methods. Much of Dr. Rickheiser's research at the University of Washington focused on occupational health services, the topic of his talk today. In 1997, he was awarded the Rome Haas, if I got that right, Rome Haas? Rome Haas Distinguished Professorship of Public Health Sciences for his research in the occupational health field. With a grant from the National Institute on Occupational Safety and Health, he established a doctoral training program in 2000 that has supported the training of occupational health services research for over 50 doctoral students. Dr. Rickheiser has published widely in leading health policy and clinical journals. In addition to his evaluation research on occupational health interventions, he has conducted study, studies on health care cost containment, managed care, substance abuse treatment outcomes, prescription opioid use, and more recently, gun violence and firearm suicide. His current work includes research on the fentanyl epidemic and the role of harm reduction activities in reducing fentanyl related death rates. Dr. Rickheiser. I think I'm muted. Hear me all right? Well, thanks for that introduction. Uh, I don't know about sexy part of the afternoon, but um, and thank you all for braving the weather. Um, I, had I known the weather was going to be, I guess I would have stayed in Seattle if you were the weather that uh, we tend to, to get out there. So, um, so thanks for coming. What I'm going to talk about today, to give you by way of background, is um, I guess what you might call sort of a journey that I've had over much of my academic career doing what generally could be characterized as um, applied research in a kind of town gown environment. And I'll explain all that in a, in, in a few minutes. But it's been um, it's been very satisfying in the sense that you know a lot of us you're trained in whatever field you're in history, English, um, health health economics, and so on and so forth, clinical medicine. Um, and, and the goal is to become an independent investigator, write papers, contribute to the development of knowledge in some fashion. Um, and what I, I've been able to do that, I think, um, but in, in a very applied context in doing work that really in Washington state made a difference in how occupational health care is delivered and made a difference in the sense of really improving outcomes for many um, injured workers. So it's been really satisfying work and that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So the topics, what I'm going to cover include um, some context on the healthcare system. Getting some feedback. Maybe that's better. I'll stay away from it. Um, uh, talking a little bit about the high cost of healthcare. Many of you are familiar with that. Um, how fragmented um, the system is. I'll present some performance data. All that is really kind of to set the context for what I'm really going to talk about, and that's um, the workers' compensation system a little bit, how that operates, and then my work in occupational health services research out in Washington State with the um, intervention that we 
design at the University of Washington in close collaboration with people from the state and um, how we went about doing the evaluation, some of the findings, and then the policy impact of that work. And, and some key lessons. And one of the key lessons that I want to just mention at the outset has to do with town gown. Um, so town gown collaboration, as it's been, as the term has been around for quite some time, really involves a lot of different kind of activities involving faculty and research scientists that are university-based, collaborating in some fashion with outside agencies, often state agencies, but not always state agencies, um, toward some, um, oftentimes, it can be a policy analysis, it could be applied research. In our case, it was what you might call evaluative sciences. We state in partnership with those of a group of us at the School of Public Health out of the University of Washington designed a couple of interventions and then it was our job to evaluate those interventions and make the findings interpretable to state policymakers and help them think about well what, what should we do in terms of changing policies or developing new programs so I'm going to talk about a little bit about that but that's that's an activity that's really always, I think, well, maybe not always, but oftentimes has presented a set of challenges. And, and oftentimes those challenges revolve around building trust um, between universities and state agencies. That's always not easy to do. In fact, it's almost never easy to do. Um, but you can do it and, and it takes, um, takes some luck, frankly. Um, I think it also takes um, good communication and um, a lot of communication because you're, you're really trying, in a sense, to bridge two worlds, the world that we all live in, academic world, and then in the day-to-day -day real life world of state policymakers and state program administrators. Um, and oftentimes, those two groups operate on very different timelines. Um, timeline for those of us that do university-based research is a little, I think it's fair to say, a little more flexible. Not always, but oftentimes. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that because I think that there is an important role for um, not only in public health, which is my field, but certainly public policy, in, in medicine, in, in other areas. Um, environmental policy work, certainly. Um, there's a lot that can be gained from these kind of partnerships. And, and I think I'll give you today an example of what I think most people would consider a quite successful town gown partnership, um, both within the state of Washington, but also beyond um, the state. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this more later at the end of the talk. So some contextual data. We all know that uh, the US is a costly system, the most costly system in the world. This slide is, presents data on the um, cost for different OECD countries, including the US as a function of um, the GDP. And you can see this is the US starting in 1980, its trajectory is higher than the other European and Asian countries. So that in 20, what, 20, we were up at about uh, 18, um, almost 18%. And most countries were more down at about 11%. And there are a lot of reasons that I'm not gonna go into today um, that, that explain that, but Suffice it to say that for many, many years, we've had a, a very expensive system. And then people ask the legitimate question of, well, what do we get for our money? Which I'm not going to, it's not the topic for, for today, but there continue to be many questions about that, particularly I think now that 
more people are becoming aware of the really significant health disparities that we have in, in this country. Um, and, and people are paying more attention to that, but that's not an easy problem in our system to overcome um, for a number of, of reasons. So this is some data and I'll, I'll try and explain easily that represents one aspect having to do with the cost of our care. This is, I do some forensic economic work and this is um, data from a Puget Sound hospital. Puget Sound is where Seattle is. Um, and it shows over time, the trajectory of operating costs per patient day, the, what I call write-offs per patient day or contractual allowances, hospitals contract with health plans and health carriers. And when they do, they agree to a certain reimbursement or payment rate that is oftentimes significantly less than the bill charge. Okay. And the reason why, and it's been a real problem. In fact, starting in January 1 of 2022, the federal government passed the No Surprise Medical Bill Act or something to that effect because people were getting care and your, your hospital might be in a particular network and the, and the head surgeon might be, but the anesthesiologist might not be. So you, could, you thought you were well insured and you got the operation you needed and you're presented with a bill for thousands of dollars that you didn't expect. So they passed that law to take care of that. But the reason really is, is this blue, this blue line. And so the hospital doesn't collect this. In fact, it has no expectation of collecting that. What it, because it, it agrees to forego 69%, in this case, $23,813 per patient day off the 31,000. And so it collects the, you know, the net revenue is the difference that in this case covers more than the operating cost. But one can ask the question, well, if the operating costs went up just this amount, why are the bill charges going up that amount? And the reason has to do, which is not the topic of what I'm gonna talk about today, but the reason really is the, the um, nature of our health insurance system, which, um, I think many well-informed people would agree is in very, has been in very serious need of fundamental reform for quite some number of years. Um, I'm not optimistic that much will change, however. Um, but this is the this is in a sense these lines tell a story that are repeated in almost every community hospital, many many community hospitals around the country. Um, and, and it, it really has become a problem because the prices that hospitals ch charge, which they don't expect to get paid, which is in itself, if you think about it, a little bit screwy, um, are far in excess of the actual cost of operating the hospital. So another problem that we, that's come to light recently in the past several years is the actual decrease in life expectancy in, in the US. And that's largely, not totally, a function of opioid overdose and the increase in suicide rate. Um, so while most countries have trended up and continue, some, you know, not everyone, but um, we've increased life expectancy over time. But in the last few years, um, that's been a decrease. I don't know how many of you heard of the term deaths of despair. Two economists at Princeton, um, Diane Case and um, her husband who's a Nobel laureate economist, Angus Deaton, I think, um, wrote an important paper a few years ago where they 
they characterize the uh, deaths that, lead, that led to a decrease in life expectancy as deaths of, of despair. Well, these are, in a sense, the slip of that. Um, these are data, this graph shows data on, on avoidable deaths. And you can see most countries have trended down and the US trended down until recently um, where there's been a sharp increase. And that reflects things like suicide, like opioid overdose that are considered preventable. And so when you look at these data, you really realize the challenges that confront us. Um, I mean, compared to other countries, we're really going the wrong way. Similarly, it's been well known for a number of years that there are substantial differences in both infant and maternal mortality in the US versus other countries. So this is again, the OECD average. Those consists of mainly European countries and a few other countries, Australia, New Zealand, Japan. Um, but a really, really big difference in maternal um, mortality. And, and much of that reflects the health disparities that I mentioned earlier. In fact, Ohio has a very, has been, most of you are probably familiar with this, a substantial um, compared to the nation overall, excess in infant mortality and also maternal mortality. So um, turning now to another problem is just the, the nature of our system, we have over 900 health insurance companies selling different health products. And on the surface, there's nothing wrong with that because you know, given the nature of our free market and capitalistic system, you want to offer consumers choice, choices about cars, choices about health plans, choices about insurance carriers. But it gets more complicated when you're talking about health insurance um, for a whole variety of reasons. So we have different coverages, there are different networks, there are different rules, there are different procedures that apply. And it is very difficult and complicated and time consuming and expensive for the medical community to navigate those different rules, those different coverages, those different procedures to know how to bill. And it is also complicated and time consuming and frustrating for patients. And I don't know how many of you have experienced this. My wife has had some ongoing health challenges and, and she spends, and I spend on her behalf, an enormous amount of time just trying, and, and I am well-trained. I know health insurance quite well. And if it takes me a long time um, to navigate the system, I don't know what people do that don't have the training or, or expertise. But fortunately, there's somebody in the room that I'm gonna give a shout out to. I hope I don't embarrass Rachel. She probably knew I would do this. Um, so Rachel, raise your hand. Okay, so that's Rachel Mason. She's a second year um, public health um, doctoral student. And she is, she and I are collaborating. I'm collaborated on a couple of projects. And, and I mentioned that I had this idea um, as I spent more and more time on uh, navigating on my wife's care, um, that those, that time, that effort that patients expend um, has a cost to it. And those costs are completely off the books, undocumented, unknown, and really not even acknowledged. And I thought this could be the basis of um, a whole research program. So at my stage in life, I'm a little too old to start a, another research program. So I suggested to Rachel, or I don't know, maybe it was her idea, but she take this on as um, her dissertation. And she's hoping to do a kind of mixed method um, using both quantitative and qualitative techniques to really dig in and try and understand um, the nature um, 
of these these administrative burdens and um, how they how patients confront those challenges um, in in their in navigating the system. So um, we'll wait to your dissertation and the papers start coming out, and then you can give another talk somewhere and and tell us what you found out. Um, we also have fewer primary care physicians in this country than in many other countries. And so, so there's not the follow-up care that there, there needs to be. And in general, our care is less coordinated. It's less coordinated today, I think I would argue, than five years ago before you know, pandemic. Um, more people are using the hospital ER as a source of primary care, and then, which of course then there's poor follow-up. Um, this again is just, I don't want to spend too much time on it. This is some data that are gathered by the Commonwealth Fund. They do a lot of very good, important work. Um, they have done for years on the health care system and quality and whatnot. So they do an annual survey and they, they develop performance rankings for European countries where one is the best and you know 11 is the worst of the 11 countries. And you can see the right hand, most right hand column is the US and they're 11th in uh, five of the six categories with the exception of care process where we really do actually quite well compared to other, compared to other countries. But then when you consider, when you put costs, which this slide does with performance, performance is on the Y axis, cost is on the X axis, the US is down here and these other European countries are, are up here. So they, they cost less, about 11% of their GDP, but they get, according to the Commonwealth data or rankings, um, substantially better performance. So turning to more what I'm here to talk about today, about occupational injuries and workers' compensation, um, Occupational injuries are um, not common, but certainly not rare. There's um, about 2.6 million workplace injuries or illnesses in 2021. Um, millions of days of lost work time. Um, for some people, permanent withdrawal from the labor force. Um, the federal government runs Social Security Disability Insurance Program which provides insurance for people under 65 who are disabled because of an injury or an illness, not necessarily an occupational injury. It can be a serious car accident or you know, a fall off a ladder at home or, or whatever. But so there are about 10 million people on SSDI and the government has gotten increasingly concerned about the cost of that program. If you're on SSDI after two years, when you initially get on it, then you qualify for Medicare. So if you're injured and you're in your early 30s, you're on Medicare for a very long time. Um, but much of this disability is avoidable. And one example of this is some data that I ran off our workers' compensation claims data in Washington State, that there were fewer than 6% I can't tell you what year this is. It was probably five, maybe it's 10 years ago, but, um, but we found that fewer than 6% of the people injured who were off work and on workers' compensation disability for six months, that's a long time if you think about it. And that should be a pretty substantial injury that would keep you off work for six months. Um, fewer than 6% were hospitalized for a day or more. So these people didn't suffer crushing injuries. Um, they had routine back sprain that wasn't treated correctly. Uh, routine shoulder sprain, neck sprain, um, perhaps an upper extremity or low extremity fracture. But these aren't um, for the great majority of people who were off work six months. Um, they never spent a day in the hospital. Um, they just got poor care that was uncoordinated um, that might have led to 
thumb level and experiencing pain, oftentimes musculoskeletal problems, injuries are painful. Um, they were not less so now, a good thing than in earlier days, but they were um, likely to get on some opioids and, and then perhaps start a downward, um, a downward spiral that kept them off work for um, quite some time. So workers' compensation, usually when you mention the word, I've done this many, many times for many, workers' compensation, people immediately glaze over. Physicians don't like workers' compensation. Injured workers don't like it. Employers don't work like it. Really, nobody likes it um, for a whole bunch of different reasons. But it, it's, it really started back in the days, the 19th century, in Bismarck, Germany. Um, and it's intended to provide insurance for coverage um, for persons who are injured while at work. Um, it covers medical care. It provides wage replacement. Um, if you're off work and disabled, it's regulated by states. There are four states that have a setup that by law, you have to purchase insurance through a state agency unless you self-insure. And both actually Washington and Ohio are among those four states. The other two states are small, West Virginia and North Dakota. Um, so that's 10 seconds on workers' compensation. The other thing with workers' compensation is that it, it wasn't designed this way, but it's it, it has evolved into an adversarial system where you have business on one side and labor on another. And, and not, this isn't always the case, but there is a tendency to think often um, that people who are injured are somehow malingering, they want to stay home from work. Nobody makes money off getting workers' compensation payments. I mean, it's a fraction of your wage. Um, so that, I'm not doing a little injustice, but that, that tends to be among some in the business community the orientation. And on the other hand, labor thinks correctly that people are taking risks. Some occupations are very, I, mean, I live out in Seattle, but I mean, if you do crab fishing in the Bering Sea, I mean, that is very risky, or logging is a very risky occupation. So, so if they're injured, they're due, according to law, medical care and wage replacement. But, but there's come to be this adversarial view in the two groups that makes it challenging that we um, had to navigate, but we were able to, I think, achieve enough trust between the two groups that they, I'll talk more about this later, that they really came to agree that what we were doing was important and they should support it and they did support it. And I can't tell you what the state paid for the evaluation through the years, but um, it was in the millions of dollars. I mean, it was, it was a, an expensive evaluation. Um, so in Washington, it's set up as a state fund program Employers, as I said, who don't self-insure have to insure through the Department of Labor and Industries, which is the state agency that runs the workers' compensation program. So in a sense, um, I'm going to refer to the Department of Labor and Industries. That's the, I want to go back. How do I go back? As um, DLI. And so that became a single payer. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that for workers' compensation, um, for two thirds of the state workforce, the DLI was the single payer. So there wasn't this highly fragmented system. The, the DLI had a, um, a platform in a sense that allowed it to, um, in partnership with the University of Washington to make these changes that were made and to more easily gain the attention of physicians um, and, and policymakers. And I'm, I am convinced that that was an important part of the success. Um, 
and there are many, this has been a debate going on for 30, much of my academic career, that should the United States become a single payer? Well, that's not gonna happen. Um, but it is true that no matter what you think about the wisdom of a single payer system for the financing of care, that a single payer system allows you to do population-based studies like we've been able to do in Washington State and test interventions and evaluate them. And that has enormous benefit, but we are not going to a single payer system um, at any time. And so the DLA ensures two thirds of the state workforce. So I like to say in terms of, of workers' compensation um, and occupational injuries, there's, it's sort of a good news, bad news story. And the, the bad news is, and I'll show you a slide in just a second, that workers who remain off work in two to three months are much less likely in a year to, to return to work. So that's the bad news. The good news is that um, the effective occupational health care can reduce um, the likelihood of long-term disability. And, and that's really in a nutshell what we tried to, to foster. So these are two curves. The, the blue curve is based on real data that's been published um, from Washington State. And you can see a sort of an inflection point here. At about three months, this, turn, this curve straightens out. So many workers go back to work, okay? But there are those that don't, after about 12 months post-injury, there were about, when these data were collected, which was around 1998, um, about what, 18% or so were off, off work. So what we tried to do in the intervention I'm gonna talk about is really move this curve more toward the origin so that at 12 months, um, it wouldn't be 18%, it would be a fraction of that would be off work. So starting around 1990, um, DLI began to initiate interventions to improve occupational health care. And I can't tell you exactly why it was 1998 instead of 1988 or 2008. Um, I think the right people were in leadership roles, especially a medical director, a close colleague of mine, a physician neurologist by the name of Gary Franklin was one of the real idea champions. But they started to say, what, what can we do to improve healthcare? It's really unacceptable that so few people that are seriously, that are injured are off work six months, they don't need hospitalization, they're obviously not getting the care that they need. Um, and so Gary has, he was medical director of the DLI, but he was also research professor in the medical school at the UW in the Department of Neurology and had an appointment also in the School of Public Health. And he was sort of the key person because he was part of the management leadership in the DLI, but he was also at a formal appointment at, at the UW. And in fact, he had a program at the University of Washington, the Occupational Epidemiology and Health Outcomes Program that got direct money um, from labor and industries to operate his program. And so he was able to um, hire a core staff and to reach out to people like myself and others and put them on various projects. Um, and, and that really became organizationally, I think the key to what we were able to, what we were able to do. So let's turn to the specific interventions. Um, this study, predated the study that I'm going to talk about. We called it the managed care pilot. And it was started during the Clinton, um, the era of the Clinton healthcare reform in the mid nineties. And the idea was to um, provide occupational healthcare under managed care arrangements 
where the plans would have risk adjusted contracts, but they would be um, on the hook um, for providing the care. That was the medical care. The disability payments operated in the usual fashion. And we did an evaluation of that. And these are the results of the evaluation. So we weren't surprised that the um, managed care reduced the cost per claim. And that's here, which is the fee for service, usual care versus that. But what we were really surprised that was this, because the way that the disability payments worked did not change. And, and the reason we thought in retrospect that there was such a big difference is that the clinics that were providing the care had to have an on-site case manager. They had to follow the guidelines. They had to have a board certified occupational medicine physician in charge. They also had to document an effort to contact the employer for return to work. One of the problems with the workers' compensation system is you may sprain your back on the loading dock lifting a 50 pound box and you, you need to you know, take it easy and get uh, appropriate initial care. But, but those kind of injuries usually resolve on their own. And, 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 and there's data to show that actually going back to work, not lifting 50 pound boxes, but going back to work is in itself healing rather than staying at home in bed with the heating pad on. And so a problem is that these physicians, they don't have time and they don't have, well, it's mainly time, um, to pick up the phone and call the employer, or the injured worker supervisor and say, well, this person can't lift a 50 pound box, but could do other things. Do you have anything at work that could, as a temporary um, job that they could do? And that kind of conversation doesn't happen. But in this managed care pilot, it did happen more often. So it was really a combination of those things that um, led to this very surprising difference. And some of it could have been self-selection. I mean, this, this wasn't a randomized trial. So I, I will certainly you know, stipulate for that. But this difference is not all self-selection. That's, that's clear. So the managed care pilot came to an end and the, the DLA, ELI got a waiver from the legislature to direct workers to these managed care plans. But Washington state is a worker choice state. So the, the DLI cannot direct workers to any provider, any network of providers, any dentist, any chiropractor, the injured worker has complete freedom of choice. And so the DLI said, well, we have these interesting and important findings from this managed care intervention and how, what are we to do with them? The managed care pilot is over. You know, we did the evaluation, um, but we think that there's something there to build on. And so what, um, yeah, what, what we did is we initiated um, in about 1998. I'm going to skip this slide here. Let me see. Um, a, another major pilot called COHI, which stands for these um, Centers of Occupational Health and Education, um, that pilot. And it really built on the findings of the managed care pilot. It was a collaborative project between the UW and DLI. And we started an 18 month policy study to, to lay the groundwork for this study. And I was the director of, of that study. And um, it was important because we really, frankly, were kind of making it up as we went along. Um, and we, I say we, the DLI hired a firm in Maine Maine had done some interesting healthcare reform work during the Clinton health reform era. And they did some work. And then a group of us at the UW did some work. Um, but we 
we couldn't just take the managed care pilot and graft it on to this second pilot because by law, it wasn't possible. Um, so one of the things we did that, that turned out to be, it made sense at the time, but none of us realized how important it would become. And I don't know if it was my idea. I can't claim that it was, but I think it was. Um, and that is that we needed a, a set of principles that business and labor would agree to that would guide this second, this COHI project. And they were, they weren't controversial. They were like improve outcomes. We didn't say anything about containing costs. It was to improve outcomes and improve satisfaction. And there were five, five general principles. And I forget what the other four were. Um, and they agreed to that. This was think something that I briefed business and labor groups on multiple times. Um, the report and this policy study. But that became very important down the road when business, when we hit some problem and business and labor parted ways on what should be done to resolve that problem. And we could say, look, we all agreed to these five principles. And if you agree to these five principles, that means that you should agree some fashion to the resolution of this particular problem. And so it, it really became um, an important part of the, of the story. Initially, there were about 500 physicians that agreed to participate on a voluntary basis um, in, the, in the study. Um, we published the earlier, early not results, but information about the design and um, the implementation of the pilot. So let me see if I can walk you through this. Um, this is something I developed to kind of guide our conceptual thinking. And if you think about it, in any community, you have a population of physicians and they provide care. And if you had the data, you could separate those physicians into what we call zones here or buckets, zones or buckets. Um, and on the x-axis here is what we call clinical efficiency, which is actually a concept developed by a very um, famous, well-known, important um, thinker at the University of Michigan, Avidas Donabedian, who wrote a paper where he talked about this notion of clinical efficiency. And that's a combination of quality and value. And so you can think that that ranges from good to poor. And if you had the right data, you could put physicians um, into four zones or four buckets. Zone one might be the physicians that achieve excellent health and disability outcomes at low to moderate medical and disability costs. Zone two would be physicians who achieve average health and disability outcomes at average medical and disability costs. Zone three are physicians who obtain, on average, poor health and disability outcomes, but at average or high medical and disability costs. And zone four are smaller group of physicians that just provide poor care at very high costs. And whether or not they should be practicing medicine is a legitimate question. But what we did is to recognize in the in the physicians that signed up for this COHI, um, what we called the, the high adopters. And we incentivized them and recognized them and made them sort of senior mentors. Because if you're a primary care physician and you have a patient in your office with a bad back sprain and you're not used to treating patients with bad back sprains, it's very helpful to be able to pick up the phone and call somebody in your local physician community who knows a lot about treating patients with bad back sprains. And so that's, that's what that group of zone one got to. Zone two, we really wanted to improve both zone two and especially zone three doctors by having them participate in the COHI, by giving them education, CME, 
system mentoring, information on best practices, um, and get them to be more likely to practice evidence-based medicine, um, giving them incentives, which I'll talk about in a minute, and improving the care coordination. So in other words, what we wanted to try and do is relocate, if you will, these physicians in these two groups more toward the left-hand side of this, more toward zone one. And then you have these physicians really weren't part of what we tried to fix. Um, it was a, you know, other, other um, ways to deal with, with physicians that were really providing poor care, doing too much surgery, doing far too many MRIs. And in fact, I think this is the case that there were two physicians, it is hard to believe. I have to use my dwindling recall memory here. But I think there were two physicians in Eastern Washington that accounted for something like 30% of the costs in Eastern Washington which is just, if you think about it, amazing. Um, so, so that group we really left, left alone. So what we did is we, we tried to redesign in several ways um, care through the COVID. We developed four quality indicators. We brought in groups of physicians, national experts to Seattle, add focus groups for the treatment of back pain, uh, treatment of carpal tunnel and the treatment of extremity fractures. We got these people in a room and we went through a day long exercise to try and get them to say what really are the best practices for the treatment of this condition. And out of that exercise came four quality indicators um, that I think I'll talk about in, in a second. And we, and we linked the adoption of those best practices to enhance physician payment. Um, and the important thing was that physicians got an added payment each time they perform a best practice. For quite some time, there have been Medicare and CMS has had any number of demonstrations where the idea is to provide bonuses for physician or physician groups achieving a certain benchmark or improving at a certain level. And oftentimes those bonuses come at the end of the quarter, at the end of the year. And those of us that have taken psychology 101 in college, um, even though you've forgotten most of it <laughs> perhaps, but, but you know that the, if you wanna change behavior, the reward should be closely linked to the behavior you wanna change. And which seemed to us kind of obvious, but um, so that's in a, an important way how what we did differed from the standard kind of arrangement. And then we developed, I'll talk about this in a second, two pilot centers in different parts of the state. And we um, initiated quality improvement activities, in particular enhanced care coordination, um, mentoring and CME for physicians, disseminating treatment guidelines and best practice information and so on and so forth. And we documented that in two papers published in 2001 and 2004. So this is the general setup. This is the pilot community, if you will, Department of Labor and Industries. We developed these COHEs. They had formal business labor advisory groups. The UW research team evaluated it. And these COHEs um, uh, got you know, physicians in the two catchment areas um, to agree to participate um, in the, um, in the Cohe arrangement. So one of the pilots was in Spokane, one was in Seattle. If you do anything in Washington or Oregon, well, I can't speak for Oregon. I can speak more for Washington. Anything like this, you have to have something on the west side of the mountains and something on the east side of the mountains. And so um, Renton is in the Seattle metropolitan area. It's where one of the big Boeing plants is located. Um, it was a community hospital with an active occupational health program. And the organization in Spokane was a rehabilitation institute that had treated a lot of injured workers over the years. So I mentioned this before, it's a, a rate here a little bit differently. So we had 
continuing medical education, and the objective there was to enhance physician knowledge and training in treating occupational injuries. The two pilot sites hired health services coordinators to improve care coordination, communicate with the employer, um, to promote return to work, and reduce provider administrative burden. Um, we provided resources for information technology to improve patient tracking. And then there was a financial component um, to promote best practices. If physicians submitted an accident report on time, which is within two business days, USEF, we designed a new form, an activity prescription form that replaced three old forms. So the physicians loved it because they threw out these three old forms and the, and the new form that we developed was far better. And there was, they got paid for communicating with the employer and then doing what was called return to work um, impediments assessment. You know, what was the problem with this injured worker not going back to work? Was it a psychosocial problem or was it, you know, what, what was the problem? Um, so the evaluation design was a straightforward prospective cohort study. Um, it was patients treated by the Covey physicians were compared to patients treated in that area of Renton and Spokane by non covey physicians in the usual manner. The outcomes that we assessed were off work and on disability one year post-injury, disability days, disability costs, and medical costs. So we, this is a um, slide showing um, the number of um, subjects or injured workers in both the intervention group and the comparison group in Renton and Spokane. So we had a total of about 105,000 workers that we tracked. We used the standard statistical techniques, logistic regression, and generalized linear models to assess the primary outcomes. And then we did two sub-analyses that turned out to be important. One was to take a look at back sprain cases because many of these, the 105 workers, 105,000 workers, probably 40%, 35 to 40% had contusions or lacerations. So if I, if I cut my hand at work and I go to the urgent care center and I get five stitches and then I go home for the afternoon, this COHI is not gonna do anything for that kind of injury. Um, but for back sprains, which oftentimes more difficult to treat, much more difficult to treat and lead to a lot more disability, we thought, well, if this COHI is going to work, if our assumptions underlying the COHI are correct, then injured workers with back sprain, the COHI should show a bigger effect. Similarly, we thought that if there was anything to these best practices that we developed, that COE physicians that adopted them more frequently as opposed to less frequently should show better outcomes. That's just kind of simple logic. And so we were able to actually do analyses for these two subsets of workers. And then we had a small set because we were working with claims data of covariates that we included in our model. So here's some descriptive data um, just to show you um, what the outcomes were like in the baseline year and the outcome year for both the COHI group and the comparison group. And you can see the what's in parentheses are the back sprain cases. Okay? So that not surprisingly back sprain, um, there were almost double the number of, portion of patients out of work a year after. Um, that actually came down a bit in the comparison group. In contrast, it went up. Um, you can see the average number of disability days. Um, the COHI group started out better than the comparison group, but you worry a little bit about selection problems there. Um, in the COHI group went down just slightly. The comparison group actually got worse in terms of of um, disability days. But the opposite was true for the back sprain cases. The back sprain cases, actually, the baseline year was almost 25. It went down to 20. And here it started out to be 25 and increased to 29. And then these are the cost data. Um, and um, this, these data, and as well as the data I'm going to show you in the next slide, were written up in a paper in 2011. So these are uh, a snapshot of our findings. Um, 
there was a reduction in the odds of being off work and on disability one year after injury um, for all cases. The odds ratio was 0.79, indicating a decrease of what, 21%. Um, um, but it was um, a much larger decrease for the back sprain cases and for the high adopters. Um, this is the findings for the disability days. On average, COE patients experienced 3.3 fewer days, but the back sprain cases, it was 8.1 days, and the high adopters versus low adopter position was almost seven days. Um, similarly, the disability costs were substantially lower. The medical costs, even though this was negative, it wasn't significant, but that was in part because the incentive payments were included for the COHE cases. And we really, I think, as I recall, our, our programmer analysts was having a bad stretch of time and just didn't want to do any more work, but which he should have done. Um, and then we probably would have seen a slightly different result. Um, so that was our short-term findings. And then we undertook a longer-term eight-year follow-up evaluation um, with just workers with musculoskeletal injuries. That was about 39, um, almost 40,000. They we tracked them for eight years. And we found that COE patients had fewer disability days, about 50 compared to 75 for the comparison group, reduced probability of being off work and on disability five years post-injury or on SSDI. These are small percentages, but big enough differences to easily reach statistical significance. 30% lower odds of having a long-term disability outcome and lower costs. That, those findings were written up in a paper in 2018. So what was the policy impact of this? Um, and we gave, I say we, it really was we, but it was mainly myself, gave dozens of briefings over the time to the advisory groups, to um, staff of various committees in the, uh, in the House and in the Senate and other state policymakers. So they were quite aware in general of, of the findings that this intervention did seem to have a real meaningful impact as best we could tell with the data. So in um, March of 2011, the legislature passed a law, Senate Bill 5801, that expanded the COE and made it on a permanent statewide basis. And, and what's interesting is that law, that law passed with one dissenting vote only. And, and I attribute that not to what those of us up at the UW did, but really to the strength of the support for it in the business and labor groups. And the way Washington works is that if the business and labor agree about something, the, the DLI collects money. It's not part of the state general revenue. They collect money from employers to run their program. And if they agree, yes, this is needed and this is how much money it's gonna take, the legislature signs off on it. And that's really what happened here. So that led to bringing in about 2,700, I don't know the exact number of physicians, new physicians into the expanded network. Um, today, um, approximately 55% of all injured workers are now treated statewide using this COE model. Care coordination has become a billable service. And I had an idea a number of years ago, but I couldn't convince the people at the DLI that it'd be worth it would be to Everybody has trumpeted the importance of care coordination, but there's never been a reliable empirical study of it. Well, now that it's a billable service in 15 minute increments, we could have done a wonderful study. Um, there would have been design problems with it, but a wonderful study to try and better understand the impact of actual care coordination and when it's done to whom, but. Um, and they also do ongoing risk assessment. So it's really not only expanded, it's been made permanent, but it's also got an infusion of resources to do some new important things. And then secondly, in the summer of 2017, I was back 
in Seattle for part of the time. We had a site visit, two site visits, by staff of the U.S. Department of Labor, Social Security Administration, and the uh, Office of Management and Budget. And those discussions led to the development of a $120 million um, demonstration in eight states that's now ongoing, testing the COHI model and some other interventions that we did in Washington State um, in other settings and among non-occupationally injured uh, people. Because a back sprain is a back sprain, whether you get a back sprain by lifting a box, a heavy box at work, or whether you get a back sprain by lifting a box in your garage at home. Um, and actually, Ohio is one of the four states that made it to phase two. It's the Mercy System up in Cleveland, Youngstown, Toledo area. Um, and they are, and the grantee is Ohio Jobs and Family Services, which is a little bit odd, but that's the way it works. Um, and among the four states, I have to, I'm on the advisory committee, Mathematica as the contract evaluator. Um, I'm on their advisory committee. And Ohio is doing, um, we'll see what the final results are. They've got another two, two and a half years. But so far in terms of enrollment and rolling this thing out, um, they're far and away the best of the, of the four states, which is terrific. So in summary, the COE intervention demonstrated, I think you really can provide an improvement in health outcomes and at the same time contain costs. Many people thought, well, there's a trade-off there. Um, not necessarily. If you improve health outcomes, you can reduce the future need for medical care and, and, and promote cost containment. Um, keys to success were, as I mentioned before, active stakeholder engagement with the business and labor community, strong medical and organizational leadership was key, the presence of an idea champion that really, I think Gary Franklin serves as not the only, but the most important idea champion. Rigorous evaluation that produced credible results um, and then an effective town gown collaboration. And just to wrap up talking about this town gown collaboration, which I started talking about, um, developing you know, effective collaborations is challenging, but it can be done. I think some of the keys to our success was, as I mentioned before, having a formal organizational financial relationship between this particular state agency and the University of Washington. Having leadership uh, in the sense of Gary Franklin, who was formally affiliated with both groups. Having ongoing engagement of stakeholder groups, which requires I never log my time, but which requires a lot of time and patience, um, but is important um, in producing good science. We were able to do that and, and building and sustaining trust. And I think that comes from the good science that produces credible results and also communication. And it's, that's not fun work usually, um, but it's important. And um, that's the end of my talk. So thank you. And I'll, I think we have some time for questions. Yeah. Did you, the, the fact that Noel gave more instruction through the COHI um, group um, versus the non-COHI group. Uh, in other words, um, <clears throat> they weren't really occupational physicians, but uh, they got a lot of the tools that occupational physicians would have. Um, so, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh no, I, I I think I think you're you're correct. I mean, part of it was the fact that these primary care physicians that signed up for the code. I I don't remember the mix of occupational medicine physicians and primary care physicians, but most of the physicians were primary care physicians, and so they got some new tools and some you know 
no arrows in their in their quiver. But the other interesting part, which we did not write up in the results, which is probably my oversight, but it was an interesting result for me, is that the physicians that had a low volume of patients at baseline, the COHE physicians, improved much more than physicians that had a high volume of patients, which you would expect, but that was an interesting finding that we should have written up. But no, I, I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just wondering is uh, workers' compensation is often um, associated with some potential for fraud. Did you encounter any um, able bodied individuals that uh, should not be compensated in this way? Well, we, we, no, that's a short answer. I mean, we weren't looking for that. And I think there is some um, evidence of what you might call fraud. I was over in Spokane doing a site visit in the fall of one of our evaluation years. And um, somebody mentioned to me that <laughs> there was an uptick in injuries that just happened to coincide with either the opening of deer hunting or the opening of, I don't know, something, pheasant hunting or something in Eastern Washington. I, I didn't pursue that, but I, I think, I, you know, frankly, I think the fraud thing overall is overplayed. I, I, I really do. I, I, yeah, it does exist, but um, I think not to the extent that some people do. Thank you for yeah. that. So, the workers' compensation system is sort of a one-payer system, is what it looks like. Well, in Washington and in Ohio. And in most states. No, 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 no. Only in selected states. Yeah, only in the four states. Okay. It, would you consider it a basically a workaround to our fragmented healthcare system? And if so, does it exist in some form in other countries that do have a single-payer system? Or is the United States unique in having a separate workers' compensation system? A good question, and I don't know anything to speak of in European workers' compensation system. So I can't answer that part of the question. I mean, I think, I think you would get different opinions about the benefits of having a workers' comp system like four states, Washington and Ohio. Now, on the other hand, that doesn't guarantee a lot of um, intervention work and in, in an effort to, to promote evidence-based care. I mean, I have to say, one of my disappointments coming to Ohio, and I, I must have had during my recruitment, four different dinners with different people that were high-level advisors to the Bureau of Workers' Compensation. And um, and they said, you know, it's wonderful you're going to be here, and we'd love to work out in Washington, and blah, blah, blah. And really, not much happened. And, and in part, which is not the subject for today, but I think, I think many state agencies, I won't say all, but my experience is many state agencies in Ohio are quite risk-averse for different reasons. And I think that um, inhibits their really doing what you, what I've talked about today. Not to say that that doesn't go on at all, because it does in, in what the GRC, the Government Resource Center does, Medicaid data is important work and valuable work. So, so there, you know, there are examples of that. But in general, um, I think whether you argue that state fund system is a better setup in theory, but it really also depends, like so many things, it depends on the actors, it depends on the leadership. And, and so I, I think there's not a, you know, all right answer to your question. Other questions? Yeah. Actually, we take you back to one of your early slides in, in your introduction. Uh, in which you had the graph that demonstrated that hospital billing rates were about four times the actual cost of, of operation. And of course, then the reimbursement level from the insurance companies were back down at about one quarter 
of the billing rate. What is driving that? I've certainly seen it in my personal bills, but I don't see who's a winner by doing that. No, I I, uh, I, I could not agree. I, what's driving it is the, well, it's reality. I was gonna say it's belief, but it's reality that that hospitals, when they negotiate contracts annually with health plans and insurance carriers, they know that they're gonna take a bit of a haircut. And so on their charge master, which is their big list of prices for all their procedures and so on and so forth, services, um, they tend to, to increase that in a, in a way that um, simply cannot be explained. In, in one of my one of my cases, the, it was a case in Tacoma. The city attorney deposed the chief financial officer of this hospital I showed you, and he could not explain. He's the chief finance CFO. He could not explain how that hospital arrives at their prices on the charge master, and if he can't explain it or justify it, I don't know who can. So it's a it's a frankly a bizarre system that everybody knows that prices aren't going to get paid and accepts that. Um, but it's a problem for people who don't have insurance. Now, many hospitals these days will say if you don't have insurance and you qualify, they make it far easier than in previous times to get a you know a fairly big discount. But but if your bill is two hundred thousand, even if the hospital knocks off forty thousand. You still owe a hefty bill, um, so it's a strange system that's evolved over time that really doesn't suit anybody's needs very well. I mean, some people have said there's some advantage to the health insurance carriers and the health plans because they can. It, any of you that have gotten medical care and you've received your explanation of benefits in the mail, you've seen. Well, gee, my, the 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 charge for my care was $1,000, but my terrific insurance carrier health plan was able to reduce that by $700, leaving $300, and they covered 85% of that, leaving me with a small bill. I don't, I'm not sure I buy that explanation, but that's the system that we have, and I don't see it, I don't, I don't see it changing in the near future. Sad to say, I mean, if it's, it would be much better to say these are the legitimate operating costs of providing good care. We will cover these costs and then and fine. But the system we have is so convoluted and almost Byzantine that it, it just um, frankly defies logic. And the, the only people that benefit from that kind of system, frankly, are the people that generate income from doing what's done to push the paper to run this fragmented, uncoordinated system that trade is on. Me? Yeah? I find it motivate the behavior of doctors. Was there any attempt to, to um, modify that behavior of the patients? You were, you were really silent on that aspect of what was done to the patients, education that might have motivated their change in behavior saying i don't have to be i don't have to be out for three weeks maybe I, i'm going to do it i'm going to be out for just a week can you comment on that a little bit yeah good good question so we we thought initially that we had to we had to concentrate somewhere and we thought we will concentrate on the interaction between the physician and the patient and we will leave out the employer in in a in a perfect world we would have done it differently, but right. it's not a perfect world. And so we tried to incentivize physicians and improve care coordination, as I explained. And the, the you're asking a good question. The patient, we, we left it up to the physicians and the clinics to try and do what they could do to better motivate patients, to explain to a patient, look, your back pain will go away and you don't need 30 days of Percocet to help that along. 
We then later on got the idea of coaching and we developed a form that we referred to as the FRQ. The F was for frequency, I forget what it was, but it was sort of like a, a risk assessment form, very easy to administer. One minute you're done, that patients, I'm sorry, nurses or physicians could administer and get some quick idea of the patient's, um, if you wanna call them risk profile or risk pitfalls and what might be focused on in terms of that patient, whether it was psychosocial, they, they have some you know, fear avoidance going on of being re-injured um, and so on and so forth. So, so we did that and I, that wasn't part of our formal evaluation though. And you measured that, was it um, self-reported? Like the high adopter doctors would say, yes, we would well, that 90%. Yeah, but no, we, because we had claims data on that because they submitted a bill. So frankly, yeah. I didn't mention this, but I, I divided the whole um, COHE, the 500 or however many physicians into the top tertile and the bottom tertile in terms of adoption of, of these best practices. And then I compared the high adopters to the low adopters. And that's what I showed. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming and braving this wonderful Columbus weather. <laughs>